there's a tradition shared today by almost every culture, every race, and every religion. A tradition that predates the pyramids by a mere 125,000 years. But we can thank the Egyptians for our modern-day practice of embalming and interring the dead. Although our modern tombs are much smaller and less extravagant, they serve a similar purpose, housing the mortal remains of the deceased. Countless billions of people make their periodic pilgrimages to visit the tombs of the dead, sometimes monthly, sometimes weekly, or even daily. Prayers are often said at these locations and many are offered up for the soul of the deceased in hopes that even by the diligence of those left behind, God's mercy and justice might yet be somehow cajoled. Whether a relative, friend, or even personal hero, we can safely say that for those cultures who bury the dead, the practice of tomb veneration is ubiquitous. That the tombs of the Jewish prophets and Israelite heroes were the locations of veneration in Jesus' day is not in dispute. Christian theologian James Dunn, Emeritus Lightfoot professor with degrees from the University of Glasgow and a PhD and Doctor of Divinity from Cambridge University, wrote in his book, The Evidence for Jesus, that it was quite customary at the time of Jesus for devotees to meet at the tomb of the dead prophet for worship. Dunn cites Matthew 23:29 in support of this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. Dunn continues, and it continues today in the veneration accorded the tombs of Abraham in Hebron and of David's tomb in Jerusalem. As Dunn admits, worshiping at the tombs of dead prophets and scriptural heroes was an old and well-established tradition, predating the days of Jesus and continuing even to our modern age. But what about Jesus' tomb? Was his tomb a place of worship after his resurrection? Dunn readily admits that there was no tomb veneration whatsoever at Jesus' tomb. Christians today, of course, regard the site of Jesus' tomb with similar veneration, and that practice goes back at least to the fourth century. But for the period covered by the New Testament and other earliest Christian writings, there is no evidence whatsoever for Christians regarding the place where Jesus had been buried as having any special significance. No practice of tomb veneration or even of meeting for worship at Jesus' tomb is attested for the first Christians. Had such been the practice of the first Christians, with all the significance which the very practice itself presupposes, it is hard to believe that our records of Jerusalem Christianity and of Christian visits thereto would not have mentioned or alluded to it in some way or at some point. So Dunn admits that Jesus' tomb was not visited or worshipped for around 300 years until the 4th century and that if it had been venerated, we would have seen some evidence of that in the Christian writings. But what kind of explanation could possibly be given for how a tomb known by countless people could have gone completely ignored for 300 years? Dunn offers this explanation. This strange silence, exceptional in view of the religious practice of the time, has only one obvious explanation. The first Christians did not regard the place where Jesus had been laid as having any special significance because no grave was thought to contain Jesus' earthly remains. The tomb was not venerated. It did not become a place of pilgrimage because the tomb was empty. I know you can't see me right now, but trust me, I'm face palming. I don't think we need to put too much effort 
into imagining that Jesus' empty tomb would have been much more venerated and visited than even Abraham's or David's had anybody known of its whereabouts. That his bones were not there would hardly be a reason for believers to eschew the place as something of no interest. It was, as the story goes, the very place where the creator of the universe overcame death and personally paid for the sins of the world once and for all. A feat even Enoch, Elijah, and Moses could not list on their resumes. Another explanation sometimes offered is that the location of the tomb was simply unknown. But that completely contradicts the Gospels. According to the Gospels, Jesus' tomb was known by countless people, all of the disciples and many women, Joseph of Arimathea, Roman guards, Pilate, and no doubt many others who found out through the grapevine. And we are to believe that all of these people suddenly forgot the location. In his work, Vita Constantini, Eusebius, the church historian, claimed that the tomb was merely hidden for over 300 years, and deliberately so by the actions of the demons in an attempt to keep Christians from knowing where it was. He claimed that Hadrian had built a temple over the site because he hated Christianity, and this is why the location of Jesus' tomb had been lost for so long. For it had been, in time past, the endeavor of impious men, or rather, let me say, of the whole race of evil spirits through their means, to consign to the darkness of oblivion that divine monument of immortality to which the radiant angel had descended from heaven and rolled away the stone for those who still had stony hearts and who supposed that the living one still lay among the dead. But Eusebius's excuse doesn't address how the tomb's location could have fallen out of memory with so many people knowing its exact location from the very day Jesus walked out of it or through it, depending on which gospel you want to believe. It also doesn't explain the complete absence in the historical record of anything close to tomb veneration prior to Hadrian's demon-induced tomb-hiding efforts. Are we to believe that demons possessed some Romans and forced them to cover Jesus' tomb with dirt and pavement so well and so completely that the next day not only could no one find the tomb, but apparently no one could even remember how to get to the exact area and see that a huge load of dirt and pavement had suddenly been added on top of the tomb? I suppose Satan must have pulled the old memory erase trick from the movie Men in Black and wiped the memory of the tomb's location from thousands of people in order to pull that one off. But let me offer my own explanation, and forgive me if it seems a bit simplified. The reason there was no tomb veneration for Jesus' tomb is that there was never an empty tomb to venerate. If there was never any Jesus on the landscape during the first century, it would explain why Jesus' tomb was not venerated for at least the first 300 years after his alleged resurrection, as Eusebius and Dunn admit. There simply was no empty tomb to venerate. If the longer ending of Mark was true, it would not explain how the location of the tomb would have magically fallen out of the collective memories of all those who knew of its whereabouts. We could easily say that thousands of people knew the exact whereabouts of Jesus' tomb as the word began to spread from the women who found the tomb to the disciples who also visited the tomb, as no doubt did Jesus' parents and brothers and relatives, not to mention the tomb's actual owner, Joseph of Arimathea, who no doubt would have told everyone he knew. What of the 9,000 people Jesus miraculously fed? No doubt some of them would have heard of Jesus' death via the proverbial grapevine. And what of all the people he healed? How could all of those people suddenly forget where the tomb was? 
How could all of those people within days or weeks of knowing where the tomb was forget all about it, ignore it completely, and not worship it as a holy site? It bears repeating. The obvious reason is that there was never any empty tomb to venerate. Again, the simple, elegant answer why there was no tomb at all is that there was never a Jesus of Nazareth at all. As I've intimated thus far in this series, the historical Jesus did not exist until Mark brought him down to earth in his Homeric allegory, written sometime shortly after the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 CE, and only after the gospel story gained wide circulation in the second century did the absences of things that should have been there from the beginning, such as tomb veneration and apostolic links, become problematic for the church fathers, and all those who saw the total lack of evidence in the first century regarding the historical Jesus. Only after the gospel story became the orthodox standard in the fourth century did the tomb become an interest for Christians. And finally, after 300 years of complete silence, an unremarkable hole within the walled city of Old Jerusalem was excavated and loudly proclaimed as not only Jesus' tomb, but Golgotha as well, the very place where Jesus was crucified. And all of this by order of Constantine. And this newly created site was declared as the holy site of both Jesus' death and resurrection a 4th century Museum of the Christ, if you will. Today, called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it receives a steady influx of believers, even though the tomb does not house Jesus' bones. That Christians do venerate this empty tomb as Jesus' tomb tends to disprove Dunn's claim that an empty tomb held no interest for believers.